Well, I think we'll get the day started. I just want to thank all of you for being here. I want to introduce you and welcome you to the new Betty Irene Moore Hall. Um, this is, although the shorthand is the nursing building, this really is a building for all of us at the health system. And one of the reasons I uh, wanted to have the event here and really appreciate Dr. Palmieri's efforts in making this happen was to introduce everyone to this great space and uh, have you all know that it is part of your home and an opportunity, to, uh, there are smaller venues to do, um, to, to hold other divisional activities or other things here as well. So welcome. This room is a little bit unusual, a little bit different, um, but I look forward to seeing how this works for our venue here. All of the presentations will also be uh, focused on your sites, uh, each at your site as well as here. But mostly, my job this morning is to thank the research team and uh, Dr. Palmieri for her leadership in putting this day together for all of us, and to thank the residents and the faculty who do such great work um, over the years, a little bit behind the scenes in the labs, and participate in all of the great uh, effort and work that is, is now coming out of the Department of Surgery. I think many of you know that over the course of the last several years, we've varied between uh, our high was number eight in the Blue Ridge rankings in terms of academic um, research ranking in the country to, uh, I think, 14. We, you know, it goes up and down. It depends on whether Michigan gets another grant or, you know, whether WashU is ahead. But I will say it's something for us to be very proud of, and I think people don't realize sometimes the great amount of research work that's being done in the department. And I just want to thank all of you. It's behind the scenes, but an incredibly important part of what we do. And again, thank the research committee for the hard work of selecting from our 73 um, applications, I think, that were put in, or something in that category. Yeah, we, had we had lots. So it's great. From the early days when it was hard to know whether we could fill up a day to actually now having to have the hard challenge of being selected. It's a long day. <clears throat> Please feel free to come and go. I'm going to turn the uh, details over to Dr. Palmieri and then also remind you that you are invited to dinner, to, which will be the awards banquet tonight uh, at the um, uh, Crocker Art Museum. So we'll have more conversation during the day. But again, thank you for being here. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Palmieri. Thank you. All right, well, everybody knows this is your day, okay? This is all the research that's happening in this department. And, you know, we had, the research committee had a large selection of really fine work uh, to, to go through. And congratulations to everybody who's on the program. Um, you know, there's clearly some people that have, are doing some very incredible hard work, and it was just sad that we couldn't let everybody present everything they were doing because it is so great. Some housekeeping, notice the EADS code, okay? There will be a second one later today, um, so to encourage uh, participation. Um, and the other thing is we will break out for quick shots today, and every quick shot has its own room. So you won't be competing with each other, and then after the quick shots, we come back here. So that way you're not sitting in a chair, because like all good surgeons, you can't stand sitting for much more than an hour. So we've arranged the schedule so you will not be doing that. Um, and later this evening, we will be having our reception. So I'm going to turn it over to our moderators, Dr. Lloyd and Dr. Romanowski, to introduce our top five abstracts. And these are, this is phenomenal work. And if you note, not a single, it's very diverse. This is, we have a very diverse research going on in this department. So I'm very proud to introduce our moderators. Good morning. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Dr. Melissa Vanover, who is a research resident in the Department of General Surgery, uh, working in uh, Dr. Farmer and Dr. Wang's lab. Okay, good morning. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about placental mesenchymal stromal cells and their impact on forelimb motor function in a rodent cervical cord contusion model. Okay. So spinal cord injury, as you might expect, 
um, is a result of a traumatic injury to the spine, most often a result of a car accident or a fall. In the United States, over 1.4 million Americans are affected by some form of spinal cord injury, and there are 17,000 additional injuries estimated to occur every year. Clinical manifestations of SCI can vary uh, widely, from mild uh, sensory deficits to paralysis or even death, depending on the spinal level that's affected as well as the severity of the injury. But post-operative or post-injury care needs can be significant with associated lifetime costs of up to $4.7 million per patient. Now there are multiple types of spinal cord injuries and of these contusion injuries or bruise injuries involving the neck or the cervical spine are the most common injuries sustained and can have devastating consequences including quadriplegia, bowel and bladder dysfunction, respiratory difficulties sometimes requiring mechanical ventilation and autonomic dysregulation. Supportive therapy is the mainstay of post-injury management with surgery largely relegated to prevention of secondary injury by stabilizing the spine and removing any impose, impinging bony fragments or management of complications such as colostomy creation for neurogenic bowel dysfunction. There are a number of organizations devoted to spinal cord injury research, including those founded by prominent actors and athletes who have been affected. Stem cell-based therapies offer the potential for regained lost neurologic function and are an area of active research of many of these organizations. Now, spinal cord injury can be divided into two different phases, acute and subacute or chronic. The acute phase is characterized by hemorrhage, release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and just a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, which allows infiltration of inflammatory cells into the spinal cord. However, during the subacute phase, um, anti-inflammatory cytokines come to predominate, as well as formation of a cystic cavity at the site of injury and development of a glial scar. The optimal timing for stem cell transplantation is a matter of debate, but is largely felt to be between three to seven days after an injury. There are currently nine registered clinical trials investigating the therapeutic potential of stem cells derived from a variety of sources. However, the majority of these cells are focused on spinal tissue regeneration or replacement and require stem cell engraftment, which presents um, the obstacles of rejection or tumor formation. By contrast, mesenchymal stromal cells are widely believed to function via paracrine mechanisms without cellular engraftment, which reduces the risk of tumorigenesis. Placental mesenchymal stem, uh, stromal cells, or PMSCs, which are isolated from early gestation chorionic villi, are known to secrete certain neurotrophic and immunomodulatory factors, and as you'll hear later today, display neuroprotective capabilities in vitro. Additionally, we have demonstrated that PMSCs consistently improve hind limb ambulatory ability when applied during prenatal repair in the fetal lamb model of spina bifida, which is a congenital spinal cord injury. So we hypothesize that application of PMSCs during the acute post-injury phase would similarly improve functional recovery after an acquired spinal cord injury after birth. To test this hypothesis, Sprague Dolly rats underwent a unilateral cervical cord contusion injury using the NYU Mascus 3 impactor, which is shown here. Rats underwent a C5 right-sided hemilaminectomy to expose the underlying spinal cord, and then the spinal column was stabilized. A weighted um, rod was then raised to 12.5 millimeters and dropped onto the exposed spinal cord, thereby producing a moderate contusion injury, which would affect only the right forelimb. Rats then underwent a second surgery three days later, during which the spinal cord was re-exposed and five microliters of PBS alone, or with a suspension of 500,000 PMSCs, were injected into either the subdural space or directly into the spinal cord at the site of injury using a glass micropipette. A sham surgery group that was not injured but underwent both hemilaminectomy and re-exposure of the spinal cord including dural puncture, were used as a negative control. Using the validated IBB forelimb recovery scale, um, we assess distal motor function of the affected right forelimb. This scale assesses a number of forelimb positions and movements while eating two different types of shapes of cereal, um, a sphere like kicks or a torus shape like Cheerios. 
Rats were scored based on predominant position and range of motion of the elbow, wrist, and digits, as well as capability of subtle adjustments of the cereal while eating. The scale ranges from zero to nine, with a zero representing minimal to no function, and nine representing normal function, as demonstrated here in an uninjured rat. As you can see, the right forelimb is, uh, remains elevated off the ground while holding the cereal, and the right forepaw and digits are capable of fine adjustments while eating. For comparison, an injured rat with a, an IBB score of one has clear deficits involving the right forelimb. The right forepaw remains resting on the ground in a grasped or closed position and is used primarily to prop up the cereal while eating. In this example, there's no evidence of function or mo motion of the digits. Rats were tested prior to injury, prior to treatment, and for eight weeks following treatment. A moderate contusion injury was confirmed in all injured rats as represented by an IBB score of zero to one after injury. And at first we compared rats that received any PMSCs to those that received PBS alone and found that rats treated with PMSCs had improved functional recovery over eight weeks. This improvement was significant starting at week six and continued for the duration of the testing period. However, looking more closely at the rats that received PMSCs, we found that those that had cells injected directly into the cord had the best functional recovery of the three treatment groups. And this was apparent as early as four weeks after treatment and persisted for the remainder of the eight week testing period. So in summary, in this pilot study, we demonstrated that treatment with a placental mesenchymal stromal cell during acute post-injury period results in significant improvement in the ipsilateral forelimb recovery. Further studies are planned to increase the size of each of the study groups, as well as determine the mechanism of action, the optimal dosing, method, and timing of administration. Thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Sure, so um, thank you for the question. So the question is about, uh, in case anybody didn't hear, whether or not these, cell, these specific cells are being used in clinical trials or clinical trials for um, any stem cell? This one in particular. Mm -hmm. Yes. So for this particular cell group that we use, the placental mesenchymal stromal cells, they, um, we are actually in talks with, um, with CIRM to do a, uh, the uh, GMP compliant uh, manufacturing so that we can move to a clinical trial. We're actually in that process right now. We just recently had a pre-IND meeting with the FDA. Now, the cells um, for that clinical trial would be used for prenatal repair, not in an acquired spinal cord injury or an adult spinal cord injury model. Um, however, um, we think that these cells uh, go away. They don't, they don't stay around. They don't engraft. We've never seen evidence of engraftment or tumor formation. And so I suspect that if these work in a prenatal model, that there will be a push to move to postnatal as well, which then could potentially be expanded to adult. This is the first time we've, we've used them outside of the in utero environment. Great, that's a great question. So um, we believe that these cells have neurotrophic factors that they secrete. And when we've looked in our other animal models, we see increased neuronal density, increased neuronal preservation. So we believe that they are neuroprotective. And we actually have um, a neuroprotective assay that we use, um, or that we're going to be using for screening. And Dr. Kumar will present that later today. Um, but we think that because of the uh, secretion profile of these cells, that they protect neurons, they might be um, ideally suited for that. Um, so since we've been using them in this prenatal congenital model of spinal cord injury, we, we thought it was important to test them also in the, in the postnatal period um, because potentially they'll be better than the other types of stem cells that are being, that are being tested. There's actually a group that's using um, embryonic stem cells that's been in the news recently, um, but that's an, that's an embryonic cell line. There's ethical complications with that, plus they have to engraft. Um, Ours work by a different mechanism, and we think would would avoid some of those ethical concerns. Media. 
Do you know if it's, um, have you looked at microvesicles, if, if it's within the microvesicles? And then if you haven't looked of what the specific factor is, just one of my friends does MSC work in TBI and found that temp3 is the, the factor that they isolated from the conditioned media that was protective to the brain and restoring blood-brain barrier. That may be something interesting to look at. A great presentation. Thank you very much. So we are actually looking at secreted exosomes. That's a second phase of this, um, of this study. We haven't started that yet. We are doing the in vitro work, though. Dr. Kumar is leading that. And um, we have looked at the secreted factors. We've done um, uh, a number of in vitro studies. And I believe that they do secrete um, the, the TIMP3, is what you said. Um, I believe that they do. I don't have that data in front of me. Um, but that's a great point. We would like to move away from a cellular product entirely. If we could use just the secreted factors or just the exosomes and not and have a cell-free therapy, that would actually be preferable. Um, but we don't, we don't know exactly why these work at this point. We just know that if we put them somewhere, they seem to help the neurons survive. Thank you. Well, thank you, Melissa. Yvonne, are you here? All right. So it's my pleasure now to introduce to you Yvonne Palma. And as Dr. Palmieri said, this is a rather diverse section because Melissa is a research resident. Um, Yvonne, I, you're a medical student? Uh, no, I'm just a staff teacher. Just a staff, yeah, just a staff. And just, she's presenting today, just a staff. Well, I'm, I'm so glad to have you here, Yvonne. So Yvonne is in uh, Rich uh, Perez's laboratory. And she'll be presenting a paper on the superiority of plasma-enriched perfusate for assessment of donor kidneys in an ex vivo normothermic perfusion uh, setting. And you probably all saw uh, recently at a Nature paper just the last couple of days about uh, uh, perfusion in a normothermic, normothermic environment for liver transplantation. So it's very apropos that you're making this presentation today. So, Yvonne. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to present our work. Um, so currently, the biggest obstacle in transplantation is the shortage of available donors' organs for transplantation. There are about 100,000 patients on the waiting list for a kidney transplant, but only about 17,000 deceased donor renal transplants per year. So in an effort to minimize this organ gap, the donor pool has been expanded to include organs from donors deemed high risk, for example, those of older age or those with poor mobilities. But unfortunately, about 20% of these recovered kidneys are ultimately discarded. So the current assessment of these high-risk kidneys involves putting the kidneys on a hypothermic machine perfusion. Even though this preservation does have advantages, it is very limited. Um, so the kidney is cooled down to about four degrees Celsius in, in efforts to prevent tissue breakdown. But studies have shown that even though there are still ongoing low levels of metabolism and tissue breakdown. There's the loss of ATP stores, and because the kidney is not metabolically active, reconditioning and repair interventions are not possible. And ultimately, the viability and the function of these kidneys is not known, and so many high-risk kidneys are ultimately discarded. So, ex vivo normal thermic perfusion, or EVMP, is probably a better adequate way to assess these kidneys pre-transplant. This is a preservation method that simulates a more physiological state. Perfusion is usually used, we usually use a packed red blood cell with crystalloid-based solution. We warm it to about 37 degrees Celsius and we give it oxygenation and nutrition. And during EVMP, the, the kidney is, has active metabolism, which causes for us to assess viability and function and also it replenishes the ATP stores. And prior studies have actually shown that EVMP is safe and feasible to use prior to transplantation of some of these high-risk kidneys. This is our EVMP circuit. So the kidney is housed on a stainless steel platform. The renal artery is cannulated and the vein passively drains into the venous reservoir. The ureter is cannulated with the soft silastic tubing to prevent any further damage and the urine is collected and recorded for further analysis in a beaker. The perfusate sits in a venous reservoir and it is recirculated continuously and oxygenated and given nutrition. We measure pressure and we adjust flow to keep the pressure within the set points. And we can also take perfusate samples during perfusion to look for pH, electrolytes, oxygen consumption. 
So even though EVMP seems to be a more favorable preservation method, there's still more to learn from EVMP. For example, what are the criteria to determine viability while on EVMP? What is the optimal duration of EVMP? And what is the optimal perfusate to use on EVMP? We focused on this third question. So our question for this project was, will a plasma-enriched perfusate be superior than crystalloid in our ex vivo normal thermic perfusion system? So for this project, we used a sheep ex vivo renal transplant reperfusion model. First, we exposed the kidneys to a cold ischemia injury by leaving them for 24 hours on ice. We then split the kidneys into two groups, plasma and crystalloid. We then put the kidneys on a three-hour EVMP circuit called the conditioning period with either a plasma-enriched perfusate or a crystalloid perfusate. We then transitioned both kidneys to a whole blood perfusion for three hours to simulate the transplant reperfusion period. So, some of the, so the solutions that we used during our project were for the conditioning period, either the kidneys received a plasma-enriched packed red blood cell perfusate or a crystalloid packed red blood cell perfusate. And during the transplant reperfusion period, we used sheep whole blood. And all of these solutions were supplemented with heparin, creatinine, and parenteral nutrition, which was fortified with insulin, bicarbonate, and multivitamins. This is some of the criteria for kidney evaluation while on pump. We looked at the global appearance. We looked at hemodynamic parameters, such as flow and resistance, functional parameters, such as urine output, creatinine, and lactate. And we looked at tissue swelling by measuring the kidney pre and post perfusion. So looking at the first part of our project, we asked, what are the characteristics of kidneys undergoing the conditioning period? So both kidneys had a healthy color throughout the conditioning period. As you can see here, they're both nice and pink. The hemodynamic trends improved over time for both groups, with the plasma group having a higher flow and lower resistance over time. Unexpectedly, though, there was more urine output in the crystalloid kidneys. There was an initial transient increase in the lactic acid for both groups, which is indicative of possibly a hyperdynamic state or a shock to both kidneys, and also possibly the release of some of these toxic metabolites that were accumulated during the cold storage. But afterwards, both kidneys exhibited a steady decrease of lactic levels over time. Both kidneys had a decrease in perfusate creatinine over time, which is possibly uh, an example of familiar function. But the kidneys, uh, the plasma kidneys had uh, gained, weight, gained less weight after a conditioning period. So after looking at the conditioning period, we asked, was there a difference in plasma versus crystalloid conditioning after we placed them on this transplant reperfusion period? Again, both kidneys had a healthy perfusion color in both. There was improved hemodynamic trends for both treatments, with the plasma having a slightly higher flow and lower resistance. But unlike in the conditioning period, the plasma-treated group actually had made more urine output throughout perfusion. The plasma-treated kidneys had a stable lactic acid, which probably is indicative of maybe a less uh, inflammatory response, while the, plas while the crystalloid had a steady increase in lactic acid levels. Both, again, showed a decrease in perfusic creatinine, again, showing some sort of glomerular function and the kidneys gained less weight in the plasma-treated uh, group. So, kind of in summary, in the conditioning period, kidneys exhibited good viability, increase in renal blood flow, decrease in resistance, decrease in creatinine, which is possible evidence of glomerular function. There was a decrease in lactic acid, possibly more tubular function, but there was that initial shock hyperdynamic state seen by the transient increase. Um, what this suggests overall is that during the conditioning period, there was a general trend and improvement in both kidneys. But the plasma kidneys weighed less, suggesting less inflammation and less edema. Unexpectedly, more urine output, there was more urine output in the crystalloid kidneys. So for the transplant reperfusion, we can see that whole blood seems to be a good model for reperfusion injury. We see that there was definite evidence of in injury dysfunction, such as lower urine output volumes when compared to the conditioning period and higher perfusate lactic acid levels. 
but kidneys overall had a good color, increase in blood flow, decrease in resistance, and decrease in creatinine. And it seems that the plasma treated group responded better to a whole blood perfusion because they gained less weight, had more urine output, and cleared the lactic acid. So in conclusion, this model seems that it would be adequate to study a reperfusion injury. There was a beneficial effect to a conditioning period and that a plasma-enriched perfusate is promising. However, further studies are needed to determine the protective mechanisms. Uh, we plan on doing tissue, perfusate, and urinary biomarkers and metabolomic studies, and we hopefully will do a whole animal transplant model. And I just wanted to thank the Surgical Bioengineering Lab and the Large Animal Surgery Center for the help with this study. Thank you. microphone here. Great presentation. Really interesting work. Um, were you using sheep blood or human blood? We were using uh, sheep blood. Okay. So, and the sheep blood was from a different sheep. So the blood that we collected from the animal that we collected the kidneys from was spun down to collect the packed red blood cells and the plasma. And then the whole blood was basically bought at a slaughterhouse to use kind of to really mimic a simulated transplant. Okay. I, I don't know for sheep, but I can tell you for humans, just as, as you go through this, the, the variability in the, the plasma in terms of the, um, its protective effects is pretty dramatic. It may not, again, I don't know anything about sheep, but I can tell you in humans, it's a big difference. And so you may find as you do this, and I don't know how many animals you use to harvest, that you get variable results, but there is um, pretty interesting. Like some are much more protective than, than others, and also the time of which it's thought and so forth. So there's a lot of variables in there that may actually, op that you may be able to optimize to even further increase it, but great work. Other question? Please, go back. This is the um, EVNP circuit, mm -hmm. and you said that you gave the, um, the kidney nutrition. Was this a carbohydrate-based, a protein-based, a fat-based? Um, an amino acid-based perfusate, um, and we fortified it with insulin uh, bicarbonate and multivitamins. No, no glucose. Uh, the glucose is it, it's an amino acid with dextrose solution. So we plan on doing histology. Um, we plan on doing just the standard H and E and PAS things to look at tubular structure. Um, we also plan to do um, some apoptotic uh, marker staining as well to see if there's any difference pre and post perfusion. Um, and in terms of knowing where exactly the damage is happening, we're still working on that. We're still trying to determine where exactly, and that's one of the questions with EVMP, is that where exactly can we optimize EVMP to really target this injury? Do we need to put them on the perfusion for longer um, or give it more nutrition? Or you know, maybe some kidneys might not even need EVMP. Um, so there's, it's a very dynamic um, model. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Our next paper is entitled Engineering Autologous Stem Cell Based Vascularized Bone Grafts for In Utero Treatment of Spina Bifida, presented by Dr. Uh, Dake Howe, a postdoc in the lab with Dr. Farmer and Dr. Wang. Okay, good morning, everyone. Today, I will, from the uh, tissue engineering angle, to talk about the, engin the, engin the engineering autologous stem cell-based vascularized bone graft for in utero treatment of Svan bifida. The Svan bifida is a, is a common neural tube defect that is a, a conventional, uh, congenital an anomaly. It is widely spread all over the world and uh, also a, a permanent disease uh, of the whole life. Uh, according to the paper published uh, on the uh, New England Journal of Medicine on 2011 by Dr. Farmer, uh, the, uh, uh, the perinatal treatment uh, for the spina bifida is better than the uh, postnatal repair. So uh, uh, our pre previous work have uh, uh, have performed the in utero stem cell treatment for the spina bifida. And the result shows the in utero stem cell treatment can improve the 
motor function in labs with Smavifta by uh, neural protection. Our results are promising, but the motor function is a decline over time resulting from the uh, trauma of the co compression. Because the Smavifta is not only a neurological disorder, it is a complete disease uh, significant, with significant uh, malformation of bone muscle, uh, muscle and uh, connective tissue overriding the spinal cord. So how to protect the repaired spinal cord from being uh, compensated by connective tissue is the critical issue, uh, issue for us now. Uh, like the schedemic diagram, in, in, in order to the uh, stem cell treatment, we, we propose to design a bony scaffold to, uh, um, to maintain the sternal in, in integrity and uh, protect the repair the spinal cord. The stem, cell, uh, stem cells, uh, scaffolds, and the biological uh, factors are the, uh, are the three uh, components of the tissue engineering. For uh, in, this, uh, in this study, we try to in integrate the three uh, components to, uh, uh, to fabricate the uh, fetal bone scaffold for spina bifida. And for the, for the cell part, uh, we try to obtain the autologous stem cell within the time frame for in utero transplantation. And for the scaffold part, we try to obtain the optimal bone scaffold to, uh, for fabrication of the bioengineered uh, bony scaffold. And for the biological factor part, we try to uh, obtain the uh, in, uh, integrating based cell, uh, cell binding integrating to improve, to promote the vascularization and the healing capacity of the uh, bioengineered bony scaffold. And to get the, uh, uh, to, to, get, uh, to choose the best uh, a treatment uh, time frame and uh, get the cell source. We need to know the develop uh, development of the normal fetal, uh, fetal spinal bone tissue at early gest gestational ages. So from the uh, 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 histo histological uh, uh, analysis should uh, the spinal bone uh, formation is in an active developmental process at the early uh, uh, just, uh, just national ages. So, uh, in this study, we need to uh, get the uh, autologous stem cell source and uh, to, uh, to con construct the, the fetal bone scaffold as soon as possible, so that uh, the transplanted stem cells can uh, participate, in, uh, uh, participate into the uh, process of the fetal fetal bone formation. The placenta uh, chorionic villus sampling is an at, uh, established uh, diag uh, diagnostic technique in which a small biopsy of the placenta chorionic villus layer is extracted without disturbing the feathers. Some papers and our pre previous work also showed how the various derived MSCs have the uh, multiple functions. So here we compare three different methods, such as uh, normal explain culture uh, and uh, enzyme dissociation and uh, the enzyme, uh, enzyme as explain culture method to get the MSCs from the CVS size villus tissue. And uh, the results from the results shows uh, the enzyme express uh, method is the uh, fastest way to get the cells from the from the tissue, and uh, then can get almost 100 billion cells around two weeks. Uh, 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 then, uh, that, uh, that that number is good enough for the application. The flu cytometry uh, should the stem cells uh, express the uh, uh, MIC specific marker. And uh, st the stem cells also show uh, very strong osteogenic uh, potential. For the second part, uh, uh, there are many different types of materials can be used to fabricate the bony scaffold. 
uh, each, of, each of them uh, has its uh, uh, advantages, but each of them also has its disadvantages. Ad advantages. So now, uh, certainly, the uh, op optimal, optimal opinion to, uh, is, uh, for us is to fabricate the comp composite scaffold from the different type of uh, materials aim to uh, maximize the benefits while addressing the limitation of each com component. The HEPLG scaffold uh, produced by our collaborator, Dr. Kid Leach, uh, is a good choice for this. Year. So we tested the interaction uh, between the HEPLG scaffold and our MSCs. From the result, you can see the MSCs can attached and grew on the surface, on the on the on the on the on the surface good, and also should, um, and also should very strong uh, osteogenic potential. An overreaching uh, goal in the tissue in the tissue engineering uh, is uh, is uh, is the development of biomaterial uh, to. Uh, to promote the, the cell function and the tissue regeneration. And then li li like this picture, the uh, integrin based cell, uh, cell binding ligands uh, on the native ECM uh, play, the, play the key roles for the cell, uh, cell adhesion and uh, also some uh, uh, cell uh, biological signalings and uh, cell uh, biological functions. So in this study, uh, we will, we will try to get the integrin based uh, ligands to promote the, uh, the vascularization, uh, vascularization uh, and uh, healing capacity of the bony scaffold. Then to improve the inter interaction between the scaffold and the stem cells. One bit one comp technology uh, established by uh, by our collaborate, uh, coll uh, collaborator, Dr. Dr. Lam, pro provide a promising way for this. One c technology is an ultra-high throughput chemical library synthesis and screening method suitable for lagging discovery against a wide range of uh, biolog uh, sorry, uh, bi biological targets, such as the integrins. Because we all know the integrins are very important for the uh, cell functions, and also there are uh, many important integrins expressed on the MSCs and the ECs. So, uh, such as the uh, integrin alpha 4 beta 1 uh, inter, uh, expressed on the MSCs and uh, the integrin alpha rib 3 expressed on the ECs. So here we use 1B1C technology uh, to screen in the in integrin alpha 4 beta 1 uh, library and get the ligands LLP2A. So the, from the results, we can see that lp 2 can support the, uh, the MSS uh, attachment and also can uh, improve the cytokine uh, secretion, secretion level of the cells, especially for the HDF. HDF is very important for the allergenesis, neural protection, and also uh, inflammation and so on. So this part is very important to improve the uh, healing uh, cap Capacity. We also uh, we also use one bias technology to screen another ligand uh, depends on the integrin alpha alpha beta three, uh, octave seven. From the results, we can see octave seven can uh, support the EC attachment, uh, uh, improve the EC proliferation, and also can improve some uh, uh, biological signals. Uh, such as the uh, phosphorylation of ARC and the phosphorylation of VGF receptor, and also can support the EC survival. And uh, we have, we have uh, success, successfully uh, immobilized the uh, ARC double seven and our P2A onto the uh, bony scaffold surface uh, by the clinical uh, the click chemistry. And in this part, the our P2A can, can support the, uh, the autologous MIC uh, transplantation and the endogenous MIC uh, improvement to improve the bone differentiation. The LX double salmon can support the endogenous EC recruitment to, to improve the vascularization of the bony scaffold. So in our future direction, uh, future direction we, we, we want to uh, uh, 
determine the bone regeneration and the vascularization in the bone engineered bony scaffold for long term uh, preservation of a motor function in the spinal bifida mo model. In, in conclusion, we have uh, as established an uh, optimal uh, isolation method to get MSC from CVI size virus tissue for fetal treatment. And we also have uh, uh, demonstrated the uh, uh, strong orthogenic potential of MSC on HPLG scaffold. We have screened two integrin based ligands by YBRC technology to promote MSC and EC biological functions and immobilize them onto the bony scaffold by click chemistry. Then the fetal uh, bioengineered uh, bio bony scaffold holds the great potential for uh, fetal bone regeneration and provides a uh, comprehensive path for the treatment of spam baby. Thanks for our team and thanks for everyone. Uh, really interesting presentation. Uh, my question was, you know, when we've been hearing about this technology over the past couple of years, one of the uh, selling points is that the PMSCs don't engraft. And I was wondering, are you guys expecting them to continue to work by the paracrine function, trying to build this bone, or are you expecting them to actually become osteocytes? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Actually, we are trying to do that now. Uh, but for the uh, for the IOPT ligand, uh, we have do do uh, did some tests, but uh, it uh, it uh, can't uh, improve the the the, the MSC survival, but it can can uh, but it can keep the survival. So in the future, maybe we will try. Uh, then this is why we we, we we try to use this ligand to modify the bone material, and then we we hope to the. The IRPD function material can, can improve the, so the MIC engraftment in vivo. We will test in, in the future. And also, if this lagging is not worked good, then we can use the 1B1C technology to optimize the lagging. And we can have for that. Yeah. It's a really nice presentation. I'm sorry, I don't understand this way out of my, what I, my understanding, but it's fascinating. But uh, what made you look at integrin in the ligands in the MSC? Like, what, whatever led you to think that, that's, that that would help the MSCs? And how do you think it helps? How do you think it helps yeah, us? Do, I, I don't... Uh, yeah. Because the integrin is very important for the cell function. Right. So... Uh, There's a lot uh, of things important for cell function. Yeah, so, so now for, uh, for, the, for the cell, like, like, like last, the last question, the MSC is uh, uh, for the in vivo engraftment or some other, other, other area uh, have some problem. So we hope, uh, because now we, we, we have the uh, one c technology, so we hope you can use this one to screen some ligands and, uh, and, uh, and uh, to improve the cell function uh, for, uh, by the, by the inter integrin signaling pathway. Because like, 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 like this picture, uh, uh, the, the integrins can support a, a lot of signaling pathway and support some function like the perforation, deforation, migration, and survival, uh, yeah, like this. So we try to do that, use the ligand to, to, to from the tissue engineering angle to, to improve the, the, the cells function in the clinical trial. That I got, but how does the MSCs relate to that? Uh, sorry, how, I understand what you're saying about that, but how, did, how does the MSCs fit into that picture? Oh, if it's for, for this picture? Oh. Yeah, how does the MS... I understand why you're improving cell function with oh, yeah. the ligands, but how did when then you're adding the MSCs to this? Yeah, and uh, and and uh, and uh, we have tested the the integrin alpha four beta one uh, alpha beta one expressed on the MSC uh, on our present MSCs. Yeah, so we use this to do. Yeah, okay. Sir. It's a great presentation. One, one of the major obstacles to tissue engineering is uh, vascular supply. You can grow cells on petri dish, but once you have a cluster of cells, then you have to have neovascularization to supply the cells in the most inner part of the graft. Um, how did you study the uh, mesenchymal cell capacity to endothelial differentiation mm -hmm. and also a survival in the graft? Oh, uh, 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 sorry, uh, you mean uh, how to test? 
how to test that. Oh, and uh, for the uh, for the uh, Yeah, for this part, for the uh, for the survival, we, we use the CASP3 and uh, MTS uh, method to test, uh, and 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 we we, uh, we we can sense this use the uh, chemical method to sense this, uh, the the uh, with, with with some uh, with some special group, and use the Avidan and the Biotin uh, Biotin uh, connect method to to coat the the ligand on the on the plate and the culture cells on the plate on the on the on the surface on the, on the ligands. Then you use the skills to, to test. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Dake. Our next presentation is by Tajay Green. Tajay. Here's Tajay. Uh, Tajay's presentation is cryptic exon splicing in the human glucocorticoid receptor. And uh, Tajay is a project scientist. And Tajay is in uh, Kiho Cho and David Greenlaw's laboratory. Tajay. Good morning. Our lab is interested in why burn patients with similar injuries can receive the same treatment and have such variable outcomes. The question we are asking is, can naturally occurring variations in the human glucocorticoid receptor at the RNA and DNA levels explain the differential responses to stress and treatment in burn patients? So just as a quick reminder, when we talk about the human glucocorticoid receptor, we're talking about stress activating the HPA axis, causing the release of glucocorticoids or cortisol. So in the classic glucocorticoid receptor, stress causes the release of glucocorticoids which then enter the cell and bind to the glucocorticoid receptor, which then dimerizes, <clears throat> which releases its chaperone proteins and dimerizes and translocates to the nucleus where it binds to the DNA at the glucocorticoid response element, driving the transcriptional regulation of relevant response genes. This is the structure of the classic glucocorticoid receptor, which is located on chromosome five and is made up of nine exons. The protein coding region is contained in exons two through nine and encodes for a transactivation domain, DNA binding domain, ligand binding domain, and a hinge region. HDR alpha is considered to be the biologically active isoform and encodes a 777 amino acid protein. There are also four other widely known splice variants of HDR, HDR beta, gamma, A, and P. Just another quick reminder, alternative splicing is a mechanism whereby some exons are included or excluded from the mRNA. This process increases proteomic diversity by allowing one gene to encode for multiple protein isoforms. So in our lab, we are interested in changes in the glucocorticoid receptor in response to stress. So as opposed to other studies that use cell lines, we're looking at changes that occur in actual people. For this study, we isolated PBMCs from blood donors and treated them with LPS for one, three, or 13 hours. HDR was then isolated by RT-PCR and variant isoforms were identified. These isoforms were then cloned and tested in a functional assay. In our screenings, we run exon to exon combination PCRs to get a better resolution of any changes in HDR, especially alternative splicing, which will appear as a second band either above or below the reference band. In our PBMC screenings, we found two such bands, and from them, we identified three novel splice variants, HDR-S7, HDR-S8, and HDR-S9. These variants retain cryptic exons between exon two and three, and cryptic exons are the result of unexpected splicing events which incorporate exons that are normally excluded as part of the intron sequence. The first isoform we identified was HDR-S7, which has a 54 base pair exon, then S8, which has a 93 base pair exon, and finally HDR-S9 with a 77 base pair exon. All the retained introns not only cause a change in amino acid sequence, but also encode a premature termination codon that results 
and a truncated putative protein that lacks the DNA and ligand binding domains. After identifying these variants, we went back and looked at their individual expression in the PBMCs at different time points using specific primer sets. We found the expression of all three isoforms increased in a time-dependent manner that peaked at th three hours after LPS exposure and declined by 13 hours. S7, the 54 base pair isoform, however, had an induction after only one hour of LPS stimulation. Another interesting finding was this second band that appeared slightly above the S8 reference band. We found this to be a combination of the 93 and the 77 base pair exons. Its expression was consistently increased at 3 and 13 hours, with greater expression at 3 hours. Next, we examined the transactivation potential of these splice variants in response to hydrocortisone stimulation. In our previous experiments, we found that HGR alpha, the reference, has a dose-dependent response to hydrocortisone stimulation that peaks at 10 to the minus 2 micromolar of hydrocortisone and steadily decreases at higher concentrations. Here in this higher concentration range, you can see the tail end of this curve in, in black. The three new variants, however, had a significantly different response. Two of the isoforms, the 54 and the 77 base pair, had no significant response to hydrocortisone stimulation. However, the 93 base pair variant had a dose-dependent augmented response that had its greatest activity at 10 micromolars. At this concentration, its activity was 1.2 times greater than the reference HGR alpha. It is also worthy of note that at the lowest concentration, its activity was significantly greater than the other two variants. We also confirmed that our constructs were expressing the expected proteins using a Western blot, using reverse orientation constructs as negative controls. We expected that the premature terminations would produce proteins that were smaller in size than the reference HDR alpha. We also found that the 93 base pair isoform had the, greatest amount, had the least amount of protein expression despite having the greatest amount of activity. At the same time, the 77 base pair isoform had the greatest amount of protein expression, despite even greater than the reference HDR alpha. However, it had no significant activity. Next, because glucocorticoid receptors translocate to the nucleus, we looked at the nuclear cytoplasmic expression of these isoforms and found a, a similar expression pattern and that the 77 base pair isoform had the greatest amount of protein, while the 93 base pair had the least. So to summarize, LPS increased the expression of all three isoforms in a time-dependent manner that peaked at three hours. And the 54 base pair isoform had an early induction at one hour. For response to hydrocortisone, the 54 and the 77 base pair had no significant response, while the 93 base pair had a dose-dependent augmented response. It also had the lowest amount of protein expression, while the inactive 77 base pair had the greatest. Most importantly, however, is that alternatives, that stress induces alternative splicing of the glucocorticoid receptor. So overall, we are the first group to identify cryptic exon splicing in the human glucocorticoid receptor. We also identified that stress is able to induce the alternative splicing of glucocorticoid receptor. Also, because of their differential activities and expression profiles, these isoforms have the potential to affect patient response to stress and treatment. We have looked at the HDR expression profiles of burn patients over their treatment course, and we have found that these isoforms are expressed in different individuals at different time periods. So there is a very real potential impact on patients. We also see the possibility for these variants to one day potentially be used as early sepsis markers, especially the 54 base pair isoform whose expression begins to increase just one hour after LPS exposure. To date, our lab has identified over 1,000 naturally occurring variations in the human glucocorticoid receptor. And as you have seen, stress can induce the expression of some of these isoforms. These variants may influence how a patient responds to steroid treatment. 
Therefore, in the future, identifying a patient's human glucocorticoid receptor profile may be an essential step in tailoring the type and dosage of glucocorticoid necessary to achieve the maximal therapeutic response while minimalizing the negative effects. I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and if you have any questions, I would take them off. Yes, due to the negative feedback. Yeah. So yes, it is a, that is one of the things that we would need to look at in terms of, like I said, the type and dosage and when and how much you give compared, if you're looking at, okay, patient is expressing these isoforms right now. One, how's that going to affect how much we should give them, which type, if it's hydrocortisone, dexamethasone, methylprednisolone, because we found that different isoforms also respond differently in terms of the dosage of what's going to achieve that peak response. So, and then there's a balance that you have multiple, ex multiple isoforms being expressed at the same time. So actually finding out what's going to be the max, you know, the best treatment course may be like I said, profiling which receptors they're ex expressing, and also us in the lab determining how those receptors respond individually as well as in combination. Yes. Just a couple questions. It seems like the main, or one of the main uh, advantages here is to identify patients that may have a differential response to stress so that you can alter your therapy. Yes. So the practical question on that is how, uh, how practical is that in real time? How long does it take to, to do uh, you know, one of these precision medicine profiles in a patient? Does it can you do it in a matter of hours or? Um. So I know when we get samples from patients, we could potentially run the, um, in terms, it, it would depend on if we're looking for specific markers. So if we're looking for just the expression of the 54 base per isoform, we can have that before the end of the day. If we're looking at the expression, if we're looking at a complete profile, it's gonna take longer because we're not only be looking for different variations, but if we're looking for specifically like if F, if the S8 is expressed, if the S9 is expressed, you know, because we've found at least 10 different splice variants to date. So if we're looking at specifically, it's a whole lot easier like if we're looking at a specific target as opposed to a generalized. So that sounds promising then, that if you identify the important ones, you can get them fairly quickly, which would make a big difference for patient care. So my second question relates to your abstract. It says that altering differential expression of your receptors may be a strategy to intervene. So I guess my question is, how, how can you practically do that in a patient? It seems to me like they're, if you give them a shock and then they have expression, how are you going to intervene at, a, you know, at a, a level of gene expression? Well, that is actually one of the things that we're hoping to do in the future, is to figure out how to induce these different isoforms or if we can actually give them to a patient in terms of, okay, we're going to give them this glucocorticoid protein to help them treat or to help them co counteract this stress response. So we're look more so looking at intervention in terms of what we could give them as opposed to not getting to them to express a specific isoform is looking more into gene therapy and, yeah. So we have looked at three different 
um, Luco packs that we purchased from Blood Source. And all three of those individuals do have the same expression profile where there's an increase in those three isoforms with peaking at three hours and decreasing by 13 hours. In terms of our patients, um, not all, pa because there are different patients in different time points, we can't at this point say that this patient is expressing this isoform when they're in septic shock because right now we're looking retrospectively. And so what we're proposing in our next go around of patient collections is to look at it prospectively where we're documenting where sepsis is actually occurring and looking at specifically which isoforms are being expressed at that time. A couple of questions. A couple of questions. The first question is, um, so have, do you have any good evidence that this is not unique to burn injury, that this is sort of for critical illness in, in general? And my second question follows to that is, how stressed does an organism have to be in order for this to occur? In other words, if you were diabetic and were maybe reasonably well controlled but not great control, is that enough systemic physiologic stress t to make this happen? We have not looked at any other patients outside of burn patients, so it's kind of hard to say, but in general, based on you know the HPA access and the stress response, it is very conceivable, especially when you're looking in terms of asthma patients, in terms of you have your responders and your non-responders and what's going to, um, what variables may be affecting how they respond to treatments. It is very feasible that this is, will affect more than just burn patients. Our final speaker this morning will be uh, Dr. James Clark presenting um, the paper, Use of Lobectomy is Key to Optimize Survival for Advanced Stage Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer Patients. All right, good morning. Uh, my name is James Clark. I'm a third year general surgery resident. I'll be discussing our work titled, Use of Lobectomy is Key to Optimize Survival for Advanced Stage Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer. No disclosures to make. Non-small cell lung cancer remains a highly lethal disease, uh, especially in advanced stages where overall five-year survival approaches 4%. The main treatment modality for these patients tends to be chemotherapy and radiation, but there's a subset of patients with limited metastatic disease who remain surgical candidates in conjunction with this multimodality therapy. Over the past decade, uh, the use of surgery in these patients has been declining. We have previously published this trend in the California Cancer Registry, seen here, uh, with surgical cohorts at the bottom of the graph, all having declining use of surgery or, and throughout the time period. Um, this trend is seen despite many retrospective studies, including our previous work, which have demonstrated that these patients with advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer who are treated with surgery have improved survival. Our unmatched data from the California <coughs> Cancer Registry demonstrates that these patients who have surgery as part of their therapy have improved overall survival. See on this kaplan meyer survival curve with the top three lines all representing groups involving surgery. Chemotherapy with surgery in red, chemotherapy radiation in surgery, and surgery alone. So our objective for the current study was to characterize the trends and outcomes of therapeutic intent surgical procedures and outcomes in the United States for advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer. We hypothesized that since 2004, the proportion of advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer patients treated with therapeutic intent surgery who underwent parenchymal sparing anatomic resection with either lobectomy or bilobectomy, as opposed to pneumonectomy or sublobar resection is increasing and is associated with a concurrent improvement in overall survival. We queried the National Cancer Database for cases of biopsy proven stage 3A, 3B, and stage 4 non-small cell lung cancer from 2004 to 2014. 
these advanced stage patients either have lymph node involvement or distant metastases that often preclude uh, surgical intervention. The National Cancer Database is a joint program of the American College of Surgeons, the Commission on Cancer, and the American Cancer Society. It captures over 70% of all newly diagnosed cancer cases in the United States from 1,500 Commission on Cancer accredited facilities. Therefore, it provides an excellent overview of cancer care in the United States, as it contains a large number of patients with robust outcomes data. Here's our consort diagram, where we started with 1.3 million patients, excluded those seen here due to missing data, which left us with just over 21,000 biopsy-proven primary advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer patients who were treated with surgery. Note this percentage of surgically treated uh, lung cancer patients has remained nearly constant around 6% when compared to our prior study where we analyzed the National Cancer Database from 2002 to 2012. This is also a proportion that we would expect when practicing guideline concordant management of these advanced stage lung cancer patients. This is the distribution of our surgical cohort uh, by stage, which you can see is predominantly stage 3A patients. Uh, we began by dividing our surgical cohort into three groups, those who underwent a sub-lobar resection, those who underwent a lobectomy or a bilobectomy, and those who underwent a pneumonectomy. For our trend analysis, we then dichotomized the cohort into two time periods, the earlier time period 2004 to 2008, and the later from 2009 to 2013. We compared demographics uh, utilizing chi-square analysis and analysis of variance testing, uh, overall survival at 30 and 90 days, as well as median survival times were compared with Kaplan-Meier life tables and log rank testing. And then we used linear regression to analyze trends in the use of surgical techniques over the study period. Here you can see that the majority of our patients um, were male, were white, and had a Charleston Dayo comorbidity score of zero or one. And these bar graphs are demonstrating the distribution of surgeries stratified by stage. And as you can see in dark blue, the lobectomy is the most common procedure performed in these patients, though there is a tendency towards fewer lobectomies in stage 3B and stage 4 patients. First, we examined perioperative outcomes for these cohorts. For each stage, 30 and 90 day mortality was lowest for the lobectomy patients, um, which you can see is 3 to 4 percent. Uh, between stage 3A, 3B, and stage 4. 90-day mortality was 6 to 9% in these lobectomy patients, in contrast to a 90-day mortality of 13 to 18% in the pneumonectomy patients. We then compared survival over time by constructing Kaplan-Meier survival curves. Here you can see the curve stratified by surgical group within the stage 3A patients alone. Survival is significantly longer for patients undergoing a lobectomy. Here, charted in the blue curve, with a median survival time of 42 months as compared to 30 and 31 months for pneumonectomy and sublobar resection patients, respectively. This association was also seen in our stage 3B patients with a median survival time in lobectomy patients of 42 months, as well as in stage 4 patients with a median survival time of lobectomy patients being 25 months. To assess trends in the use of these surgical techniques over time, we performed logistic regression with the outcome variable being the number of patients in each surgical group. This graph shows the frequencies of surgical types over the study period in our stage 3A patients. As you can see there's a significant decrease in the frequency of pneumonectomy over time within these patients. This was the only significant trend. Uh, there was no change in the frequency of lobectomy performed over time within any of the stages. So our data therefore suggests that lobectomy in advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer patients is associated with both improved perioperative as well as long-term survival outcomes when compared to sublobar resection or pneumonectomy. However, it's difficult to elucidate if this is a true causative relationship as we may not be accounting for selection bias that's inherent within these surgical groups uh, when doing a retrospective database analysis. Last year, we reported on our previously created surgical selection score. This was designed to help quantify the selection bias in surgical patients. The surgical selection score is a calculator. It provides a number that predicts the likelihood of a patient undergoing a therapeutic intent surgery for their advanced stage lung cancer. To review, the surgical selection score was created by taking the logarithm of the odds ratios of each of the independent variables here within our uh, logistic regression model with the outcome being selection for surgery. We then multiplied the logarithm of these odds ratios by 100 added the total, 
and generated one numeric score for every patient. Our results demonstrated that the probability of surgery increased as the surgical selection score increased and the probability of long-term survival also increased with increasing the score. So for this analysis, what we have plotted is a histogram with the frequency of, or the number of patients at each surgical selection score in our sublobar patients. As you can see, there's a pretty wide variability. There's a mean score of 788 and a standard deviation of 138. So these sublobar patients had a lower surgical selection score and more variability than the other surgical groups, which you can see here in pneumonectomy as well as lobectomy. The pneumonectomy and lobectomy patients have very similar distributions at a much smaller range and in general a higher mean surgical selection score than the sublobar patients. These distributions suggest that survival differences between pneumonectomy patients and lobectomy patients may truly be attributed to differences in perioperative outcomes. And they also suggest that pneumonectomy should only be done in highly selected cases. So principal limitation of our study is that the intent for which surgery is performed is not captured within the National Cancer Database such that we cannot reliably determine why a patient underwent a pneumonectomy as opposed to a sublobar resection or a lobectomy. As such, we don't know if these resections were done uh, necessarily in a diagnostic, palliative, or therapeutic intent. Additionally, the retrospective nature of this analysis makes it prone to many biases. For instance, an analysis of surgical practices over time is likely to be affected by changing surgical practices, such as adaptation by many more surgeons of bats or robotic surgery that may make lung-preserving resections more feasible. And additionally, the National Cancer Database currently doesn't have uh, data on preoperative pulmonary function or smoking status. But in conclusion, our advanced, for advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer, lobectomy offers both perioperative and long-term survival advantage, which is what we expected. We hypothesized that lobectomy rates would be increasing over the past decade, but we found that the use of lobectomy has been constant over the study period. Importantly, though, we did see that pneumonectomy rates are decreasing within stage 3A patients, which is key for optimizing survival in these advanced stage lung cancer patients. Further evaluation of these patients is needed to identify the patients most likely to benefit from surgical resection. The surgeons need to be aware of the importance of lung-preserving techniques and their influence on optimized outcomes. Moving forward, we plan to perform more robust analyses of patients with similar surgical selection scores to determine which factors are predictive of choosing a parenchymal sparing anatomic resection, like a lobectomy. And then additionally, we'd like to implement the surgical selection score prospectively to try to identify uh, more patients that would be considered for a therapeutic surgery in the multimodality treatment plan so that more advanced stage lung cancer patients can get uh, improved quality, uh, overall survival from surgery. I'd like to acknowledge our funding sources, particularly the Department of Surgery Outcomes Research Group, whose support was crucial in the completion of this work. And I'd like to thank Dr. David for her mentorship over these past three years. Thank you. I'll take any questions. So, Dr. Clark, oops, nice presentation. Uh, my question is about how exactly how you plan to implement the prospective use of the scoring, because I think that really is where the bang for the buck may be in trying to make this a more um, proactive and um, meaningful in terms of clinical implementation? Sure, so the use of the surgical selection score has kind of two factors to it. One, we want to identify, because our current NCCN guidelines for which advanced stage, stage 3A, 3B, and stage 4 patients can receive a therapeutic intent resection, very limited. It's those with oligometastatic disease to the brain um, or to the adrenal gland. And so if we're being concordant with those management guidelines, there's a lot of patients who are, have very limited metastatic disease or have great preoperative pulmonary function who are not being considered for surgery. But we have a plethora of anecdotal data saying that they still do well with resection, or if they have isolated treatment of their isolated metastatic disease, that they still do well after that has been treated and then have resection of their primary lung cancer. And so what we'd like to see is, one, does the surgical selection score help us predict patients who are not necessarily on those guidelines that would benefit from resection in an objective way that accounts for the bias that is the crux of the issue with our retrospective anecdotal data? And then two, moving forward with this study, can we help identify 
components of a surgical selection score or add to it to identify the patients who are receiving pneumonectomies that would be better served with a lobectomy because we know that it has an improved survival benefit. Hi, I'm uh, Matthew Mel from Vascular Surgery. For those of you who don't know me, I enjoyed your talk. A uh, couple of questions. I, I, I think you focus on the limitations of the retrospective data because you, you don't really know why, for those who received surgery, why lobectomy versus sublobectomy was, was chosen. So my first question is, is there a way to, I'm not familiar with the, the, the particular data set that, that you use, is there a way to link it to other data sets so that you can capture some of those um, comorbidities in terms of COPD, severity of COPD? And then my second question is, when you're describing long-term mortality, does the database tell you why they died? Because there may also be a bias where the patients were getting less surgery because they had more severe underlying disease and they were dying of their underlying lung disease rather than of, the, of their cancer. Sure. Uh, so for your first question, I don't know particularly that the National Cancer Database has been linked to any other database that would give us more pulmonary function data, but I do know many, uh, especially the Society of Thoracic Surgery database has started to be linked with Medicare databases to give us longer term outcome data, which is uh, good that we're having success linking these databases. I think that's important as we start to exhaust the data available within these large national databases. Um, for your second question, this is all cause mortality, which some would argue is more important than disease specific mortality. But in terms of looking at uh, survival for lung cancer, that's definitely the largest bias we're concerned about that the patients who are being selected for surgery have some preoperative uh, reserve that they're a better surgical candidate, less smoking history, or their the just anatomic location of their tumor makes it more amenable to a resection. And so it's very much a surgeon and patient uh, discussion, case by case basis, that these patients are being offered surgery. And we'd like to more objectively determine a way to, to find these patients that would benefit from surgery. Adjuvant therapies, I mean radiation, chemo? Uh, not specifically in this analysis, we didn't add that. But we do have the data for it, so that would be something we could Yeah, because I think if you're talking about overall survival looking at, you know, cancer patients, you know, there's like that clearly we know, you know, affects your overall survival outcome. So I think it's, you know, there's a big bias in that, you know, that you're just looking at surgery as one of the modalities that you, you know, are looking at for treatment. So that would be like interesting to look at. Yeah, we we'll definitely add that in. So we tried to get at that with 30-day versus 90-day mortality. Um, we didn't specifically look at complications. I'd have to look at how robust the database actually is to allow us to include that in the analysis. Unfortunately, there's a, with these large databases, there's lots of missing data that you have to account for. So that's the end of the first session. So thank you, Katie, and thank you to all, and a big round of applause to all our presenters. Tina. Okay, now the fun starts. You get a little exercise for the poster session. Now, for those who are tired, there is room 1155, about 20 feet away from us, for the poster session one. The second poster session is one floor up, 2603. So those who feel like they have a spurt of energy left in them, second floor. For those who haven't had their run yet today, go for room 3400 on the third floor, okay? So you have your choice of three levels. And then the highlight of our day, Dr. Kozar, I purposely have not introduced her yet. She's gonna talk to us about my favorite topic, which is blood, okay, and bleeding, which we never see here, right? at 10.30, okay? But for right now, the slow pokes get going for the first floor, medium, second floor, third one, third floor. Okay, so the uh, quick shots start at 9.35.